A near vertical incident signal. What I've tried to do is to give you a quick picture of what's required for emergency HF communication. You're not dealing with VHF or anything else, you're just HF. Because if everything hits the fan, you're probably going to be down to HF. And particularly if you're living behind a mountain somewhere and don't have any direct line of sight to uh, any one of the bigger EOCs, you're going to have a problem. So, it then becomes a matter of, of how, how the system is configured to handle that. The main thing is, of course, the antenna and how you're going to set it up, where you're going to set it up, and what have you. This particular system, we've uh, done several of them, uh, some testing on them, and you can literally have it up and operating in about 30 minutes from the time you arrive at wherever you're going. So, Sean, I'll agree with that. Yep. Yeah, it goes up quickly, and all I, I didn't bring, well I did actually bring with me some. All you need above uh, this is some method of tying the, uh, connecting the insulators on the end of the wires to where are you, where are you going to put it in the ground. I suggest something like 12 or 18 inch lengths of 3 8 rebar, something real cheap. And a hammer, just pound it in the ground, and that, that's all we did with any of our testing. And it works extremely well. The, the big benefit to the NBIS antenna is that it is excellent when it comes to isolated places behind mountains where you don't have good line of sight communications. Near, near vertical incident sky wave or incident signal, uh, what are we trying to do with it? The object of the antenna is to send as much energy as possible straight up. You say, what the hell good is that? Well, the F2 layer of the ionosphere will refract that down, and given the height of the, of the F2 layer at a given time, depending on the frequency, will depend on the range you've got. And what you should have, just go to this, we can go back if there's a... Uh, press up to go, yeah. There's the radius that you, you would get, about 350 miles from an NVIS antenna. You see that, here's the circle there. Doesn't show up too well on this. And that's assuming some, somewhere about the center of the island there. And so what you're, what you're doing is you're essentially firing that signal up. It's going to come down, it's going to cover even the uh, the area outside of your ground wave, okay? and you're going to get really good communication probably out to about, as I say, 350 miles. And depending on the frequency, uh, it could be further. If you look at the difference in antennas, you've got <coughs> verticals, and verticals don't work very well uh, for uh, HF communication local. When I say local, I mean within 350 miles because it's got a very low angle of radiation. So if you're sitting behind a mountain, that's all she wrote. It's going to hit the mountain and, and it's going to reflect right. all over the place, but you're not going to get out. Right. If you use an actual dipole, uh, horizontal dipole, what you're going to end up with is a multi-directional signal, okay, with a lot of signal going a, a parallel to the Earth in two directions, off the side of the antenna and very little going up. However, if you take that dipole and fold it down and cross, what we do is cross the dipoles, cross two dipoles, then that energy is going to be sent up. And that's where the NBIS comes in. That's the three different antennas. That, and it's, it's in this presentation. I've, I've got it in this presentation. So, and Sean will get this. So, uh, I only did this, I'll go back just a bit. Uh, I only did this one to show you what the, Here's a description, very, very simple, of about what will happen with three different types of antennas and why we use the NBIS.
Also, if you look at the uh, that circle that we drew there, uh, that covers well into Washington State as well. So it gives you a, a pretty good uh, coverage uh, from the University of Colorado. The other thing to notice with an NBIS, I made a note there that they're less affected by noise. Uh, thermal noise that, that is generated in the atmosphere comes in usually at fairly low angles. All, that, all of their research has, has shown that. So the NVIS having looking more sensitivity towards high angle, it does reduce a lot of the noise as well. It actually works really well close to the ground, which is another big benefit of it. And I've given a reference down here to uh, this antenna theory of design. This is for NVIS, and it's one of the best ones I've found. And it, it's one that the uh, American military, uh, one of the guys that was working for the uh, military, put this up there, and it's really worth looking at. And as I say, anybody that wants a copy of this, I've got it on a thumb drive here, and I'm going to give it to Sean, and Sean can pass it out to everybody. This is a low security operation. <laughs> Okay, now the antenna that we've designed is for 3.522, 5.3465, and 7.24. So it's essentially 80, 60, and 40 meters. <coughs> As I say, the antenna dipole section is only designed for 80 and 40. But we found with a decent tuner, it will pick up uh, the 60 meter without any problem. Everybody, anybody here familiar with ESNEC software? Okay, ESNEC software, something if you're serious about wanting to get involved in antenna design, I've given, I've got everything on there, uh, later on you'll see the URL for it. It's a guy in the States that wrote it, uh, it's a radio, he's a radio amateur actually, it's a really nice piece of antenna design software. I think he sells it for about 39 bucks. It's not expensive. Uh, we use it for, uh, and all of the calculations I've done today, the stuff I'll show you, were done on ESNIC. Now, antenna design, what are we looking at? <laughs> There's our standard center-fed diagram. Okay? And what I've done is I've uh, broken it down, uh, lengths down for the frequencies that we're dealing with here. You can calculate your own, and the equations are there. Uh, this part of it is very straightforward. And actually, what you'll find out when we look at it with the software is that the resonant frequency that you calculate here is going to be pretty damn close to what it actually turns out to be. Now, every time you build an antenna, the ground effect near it is going to have an effect on it. So what you really need to do is be able to test that antenna after you're, you're finished constructing it. Put a standing wave bridge on it and uh, use your, your radio and uh, get an idea of where is it resonating at. As you'll see, though, with this, um, go through all the calculations and then if you do an actual check on it, you'll find that it's very, very close to what, what, you've, uh, what you've calculated. There's the SNX software, and I don't want to go into a lot of depth on it because it, it's a fairly simple but complex piece of software. However, it does have an excellent help file in there. So if you want to get involved in, in it, that would be a, a good one to do it. Notice that what we've done is where it says wires here. Uh, we have put it in for, uh, what frequency did I put in for that? 40 meters, 7.24. So you put the frequency in, it'll give you the wavelength, and then you have to, what you have to do is add the wires. Now the wires are here. If you push, if you click on this, it'll bring this one up here. And these are the wires that are involved. So you're going to have quarter wave on each side for each frequency. So that means 
four wires. Well, how come we have five? Well, one problem with ESNIC is that, that what you're trying to do, the software doesn't essentially like. You're trying to cross two dipoles. And it says, mm -hmm. this is a little weird. So what we do is we added a half a half of a foot, 0.5 of a foot on both sides. And that is essentially taken up inside here. Got about six inches. Okay. Or as we say, GEGW are good enough for government work. And these, you can see, if you look at that past the ceramics, so you can have a look at it. This is the head unit for, this will screw just onto the top of that, so you're in, you're in business. So you see how easy it is to put those together. They're inexpensive and uh, really waterproof and you're not going to get any problem. It's all stainless steel uh, fastenings and stuff on there other than problem. So what we've done here is with we've done it, we're going to get it to do the calculations. And rather than go through all of that, You Martin, can actually, sorry, Martin, when we were in Tassos, we were running 40 meters and 80 meters, correct? Yeah, yeah and 60. And 60. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, I didn't go on 60 because we had a server problem right. in, in the office. And so what I wanted to do was to connect to SNS Mail on the server, but since the server had decided <coughs> to like me, we couldn't do it. Just in time. So that's why we did 40 and 80. Now, what, what this will also do is it will actually show you diagrammatically there's your antenna. So you can get an idea of, well, does that look about right or, you know, in the software. So that's handy. And then the next thing, and probably more important, is you can actually have it, the software, look at the at the information you put in and make a decision on where does it resonate. Well, if you take a look at this one, this is where you do it. You, you click on SWR and you have to set up a few things in there, but it's quite straightforward. And there's, there's the resonant points of the antenna. And notice that the resonant frequencies are very close to the uh, actual expected value. Yeah. This one's 7.3. And that's 3.4. So pretty pretty accurate as far as uh, shut. Just don't recommend you lean on that table. I <laughs> see. <laughs> Just say. <laughs> <laughs> so for these antennas, what uh, are they like? More designated or required to be like frequency specific? Like one particular frequency, or is there like a bandwidth range that you can well, expect? Well, yeah, and a very good question. There's your bandwidth. Okay. From one side of that to the other at 3 dB point. Okay. And so you do need a tuner with it if you're going to... Now, if you wanted to operate right on that frequency, you wouldn't need a tuner. Okay. But we know that that's not going to happen. We know that you're going to want to change frequency, so you do need a tuner. You said it works best from 3 to 10 megahertz, right? Well, that's where NVIS works best. Yes. Yeah, up to 3 to 10 megahertz. And that's why we want to get our hands on those EMBC frequencies, because... One step at a time. They cover <laughs> 3 to 10. 3 to 8, I think they are. So, hey. Everybody in this room agrees. You're preaching to the converting. <laughs> no, but you asked why. Uh, yeah. uh, they're all... All suitable for NVIS. Correct. If you take a look at the at the reference material uh, on NVIS antennas, they found that the maximum uh, radiation characteristics, if you will, is probably about a 40 foot height. So mm -hmm. if you can put the antenna up 40 feet, and if you and, and if you take a look at the reference material I've given you, it gives you the relative gain depending on height. Okay? Is that so, is that forty feet at the very top of yes. it? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, so how far are the radials from the ground? No, the radials can be right out at the ground. So oh, in, okay. in, 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 in essence, you're getting the perfect, pretty close, if you calculate it, you're looking at pretty close to the 66 degrees that they figure will give you the best result. Okay. I had, a, I had a comment though. Uh, one, one thing about um, when we were doing that going out to Tassis and Sayward stuff, um, Martin had a beautiful antenna on the top of his truck, a very expensive antenna, which would allow him to drive around and operate HF, which has certain advantages. But the cool thing was that antenna, which was several thousands of dollars. Six thousand. I wasn't going to say that price, but anyways, it, was, uh, it didn't perform as well as this thing. And this thing, of course, costs a fraction to build. So it's one of those wonderful examples of the um, thinking about the purpose, what the point is you're trying to do. We don't have to necessarily be driving around and running these things. And this is a much more cost effective and turned out in these situations to work better. Now, there's the actual scan that we did on the antenna using the device that I, uh, that many, uh, uh, network device that, that, I, that I showed you. And there's the results that we, that we got. And you can see that you're, this is, this is the result of one, so there's a one in there. This is one. We were 3.46, and we had a uh, SWR 1.241, which was, now this is actual. This is what it, what it actually measured. So, um, and you can see that all of the numbers that we've looked at on these right from the start are all pretty close. Which goes to mean that, which goes to show you that you don't need a lot of, of technical equipment in order to build and use these antennas. And two, of course, was this one here. And two, 7.335. And 1.2 So, do you have a picture of this antenna? Uh, no, I don't. If, you got, if we can, if we got a USB stick, I can, I can um, transfer you one of it being put we, up in Gold River. Or we have. Uh, what I've done now, just looking at the construction, the, what the antenna looks like. Um, I was assuming that everybody had, had an idea of what it looked like. If you cross two dipoles, like so, um, and bring them down, tie them off, off the, the uh, center of this, that's the antenna. When you have a 10 foot uh, mass like over here, and you have 80 meters, yep. uh, how do you get a, a 70 degree angle? You don't. That's, that's the problem, that's why it's not as, the gain isn't as good at 10, 10, uh, 10 feet as it's going to be at 4. Oh, I see. Okay. And you can't change the length of the dipole or you change the resonant frequency, so you're SOL. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the benefit of this though is that it does work very well and is easily portable. But if you can put it higher, yeah, yeah. If you've got a location uh, where you can actually put up a 40-foot mast, you can do maybe that of the same stuff. Although my suggestion is, if you're going to go higher, to use the two-inch rather than the inch and a half uh, pipe. So it's got a little more. But you don't have to worry about guying it because the radio's guyed. So it's a really simple, simple antenna to use. Okay, there's a, a picture, a cutaway picture uh, of the, the, head, the head of this antenna, the thing that I sent you around it that's in the front of Sean. Um, all this is, is this is a six inch piece of inch and a half uh, PVC with, an end, with two end caps. You can't see the other one because it's buried in here. And that's what we use to put the connector on. The nice thing about it is it's extremely well done from the standpoint of getting, keeping corrosion out. Works well. And if you're using these, my suggestion is that you put a little bit on the threads, put a little bit of, of Vaseline or something like that on it so that they don't, because this damn stuff, if you leave it for a length of time, tends to seize up a bit. 
either that or never sees or something like that. I suggest using never sees on the connections here. And uh, as I say, mine's been up there for four or five years and I've checked it. Connections are still as good as when I put it up there. So there's no maintenance needed on the antenna. You've got it as a permanent installation. Okay. And this again is just a, another backup on the, on the construction. Just showing you essentially what you see here. And this has been done so that you can take it away and, and have it if you want to refer to it. Two five foot sections. And there's, there's essentially a picture of the antenna if you want to see. So where's your 60 meter in there? You've got your 40 and your 80. Yeah, I don't have a uh, 60 meter okay. radio. The tuner picks up 60. Oh, okay. Okay? So the harmonic of something. Sir? So it's the harmonic of something. Uh, yeah, it is. It isn't really, if you look at the scan, uh, well, all the tuner's doing is is providing the match to, to, to make the thing resonate. But yeah, it works really well. It can, it can improve it slightly by putting a one-to-one -one balloon in the top uh, of the thing. Uh, I didn't do that. I found that it, uh, I haven't I've done any testing with it, but it would theoretically be better. What you could do is add a, another piece here that's maybe four-inch pipe for the foot length, put a balloon in there. And yeah, you could do that. It's not a big thing. But I, I doubt whether you'd get a comparison if it was going to be as good as for the effort. <laughs> no, it's balanced, but balance going to imbalance the coaxes on that list. There's a there's a picture of what we did with this. And this, this was hinged up here, and we just did down, coiled up the wire, off. So from, a, from the situation of, if you put that on, a, if you had something set up uh, for portable deployment in case of an emergency, you had a vehicle, uh, all it would take would be having that on a, in the corner on a piece of plywood, two people lift it up, bolt it down, you're in the business. You've got the vehicle, you're powered from the vehicle, so away you go. And we found that worked extremely well. We did tests all up and down the island with it, and we're amazed at how well that worked. Does the vehicle act as a counterpoint? Uh, no, the vehicle's not big enough to provide a counterpoint. For 80 meters, it would have to be very, very large. Mm -hmm. But. Um, we just found that it, it, it worked well, and uh, it was easy to erect, it was very simple to deploy, it worked extremely well. There's the equipment setup we used. We, we used uh, these uh, LDG Zipline Pro Tuner and pack it on that. Are you all familiar with the differences you're going to get with digital data versus voice? Yes, no? Well, vo voice, yeah. if, if, you, if you think about it, in order to, to get a voice signal through, your signal to noise ratio has to be better than one, or usually better than zero. Okay, so that means that the signal level has to be above the noise. Okay? With data, your signal level can be as much as 18 dB below the noise, and you'll still get a signal through. So it's one of the big advantages for using uh, text or, or digital radio over, over the system. Okay? because you'll be able to get through when you can't hear the signal. And if you notice on Winlink, it'll tell you, don't transmit until you make certain there's nobody on the frequency, right? Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. How do 
we know we can hear them? <laughs> now the software will tell you if there's somebody on there. You won't be able to hear it, but the software will say occupied. In, in the setup that you've gone through, what is your um, wattage capacity for output? For the antenna? For the antenna. You could probably uh, put 500 watts in it without the problem. Hmm. Uh -huh. Your limitation is going to be the coax, not the antenna. I'm using, uh, I'm using number uh, number 10 wire. Yeah, and that's pretty hefty. It is hefty, and, and also, too, uh, the reason we did that is that uh, we've never had any trouble with wind or anything like that. The, the, the result of using the heavier wire, and make sure it's stranded. Do not build an antenna out of single conductor wire because it will vibrate and break in wind. But stranded, we don't, you won't have any trouble with. Any other questions on that? There's a little bit of a history on, on the antennas and just something on noise elimination. This is a unit that, uh, that we have available and this will actually allow you to uh, get sing a voice signal uh, out of the noise. It doesn't work anywhere near as well as the digital signal. But it will take an, uh, an analog signal and reduce the noise. And uh, they're not all that expensive, they're pretty neat. They're a, a company called BHI out of, uh, out of England that we were dealers for. I ran into them in Germany at an exposition and uh, had a chance to test some of their equipment. And mm -hmm. It's absolutely amazing. You got one from me. I bought one from you and I'm really, really pleased I did because I, on my ICOM M802 on the boat, it makes a huge difference because it comes with a little speaker, but it's nothing compared to this thing. No, it it's just gets sort of the garbage out of the way, it makes it clearer. Yeah. Well, you're looking at, uh, hell, can you imagine what it would have been like before we had single sideband and everything was AM? I mean, it would have been all the heterodynes out there, so right now you've got to... But HF is a noisy uh, area, there's a lot of noise on it. And if you're in a marina or something like that, uh, there's a lot of commercial noise available that can wipe out a signal. So... Yeah, like Discovery Harbor. <laughs> 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 Dead zone. Yeah. So that's pretty well everything. I just put a. This can be adjusted, by the way. You can adjust the amount of uh, noise cancellation. And that's it. Yeah. Other than any more questions? <clears throat> One thing uh, the radios come pretty close to the ground on the antenna, mm -hmm. and the voltage is pretty high on the transmitter. You have to make sure to keep people away from it. Unless you don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> if people say that on the boats, they say, well, you know, what happens if somebody grabs on They say, well, they're going to have a big machine experience. <laughs> After two or three times, they learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if they're stupid, it's two or three times. <laughs> but yeah, RF burns are not fun, uh, for sure. But. Um, yeah, you don't want anybody around the antenna if you're putting any power out. It, uh, you'll feel it. But the distance you need to be away is probably like 12 meters or something like that. For? To well, not have the RF um, burn issue. Oh, no, you don't need anything like that at these frequencies. Because you're not dealing with enough power. If you're looking at uh, 100 watts, um, you would, you would probably, if you grabbed the antenna, you'd probably get a burn. You'd probably get an RF burn, but it wouldn't be, wouldn't kill you. It would get your attention, but... <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? You're using just um, standard PVC gray glue, I see. PVC, I uh, use the, and as I specify in the list, uh, the 40, uh, Schedule 40? Yeah, 40, what do they call it? Um, you can get 20 and 40, okay. and, and you want the thicker stuff. Um, and, and as I point out very carefully, do not glue the top on this. Okay? Because you want to get in to do anything on it, you can. And it will never come off. I've never had any water get into these. 
which is the other nice thing because nothing screws up an antenna worse than getting water in it. You need to really use a good insulator on these so you're not screwing up the, the uh, resonant frequency or the impedance of the antenna. And I use um, that nylon parachute cord for tying it, you know. It's cheap, cheap like borscht. And uh, drive one of those uh, rods in the ground, stretch it out, uh, tie your uh, parachute cord, which is already tied around your insulator, which is tied on the antenna. That's it. What we're going to do today was actually measure the wire out and make one of these, finish making one of these.